Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for listening us. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us. And uh, yeah, we hope you are all having a great day because we have a great show planned for you where we, of course, have our guest. Uh, you know, last Wednesday of every month is dedicated to cybersecurity. With none other than the man himself, Mr. Scott Schober, and we will be talking about a number of different topics, including, uh, you know, some uh, a five million dollar car that can hack into an iPhone. Seems like a lot cheaper just to buy a stun gun and knock the person out and take their phone. Um, but hey, you know, we're gonna talk about that. Why teens should maybe learn how to hack, or why the NSA has these buildings strategically placed all over the country. Uh, folks, it's gonna be a great show, and. Hey, you're going to be able to listen to all of it right here. And of course, uh, also be sure to check out the computeramerica.com. That's our website. And you there, you can find a link to all the articles that we do, everything that we uh, have, everything that we are talking about here today. And yeah, be sure to do that. And uh, yeah. Oh, and by the way, while you're at computeramerica.com, check out the, uh, Let's see, check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, and be sure to check out the live video stream brought to you by OWC. Also, if you want to join us in the chat room, if you want to talk to us or ask questions, feel free to at twitch.tv forward slash computer America. So all that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into our conversation. So as I said before, he is a regular here on the program by now, and we are happy to have him. So joining us is Mr. Scott Schober. He's the author of Hacked Again. That's how we first got to know him. And, you know, he also runs Berkeley Veritronic Systems and, of course, is just an all around knowledgeable person when it comes to the field of cybersecurity. So, Scott, welcome back onto Computer America. How you doing? I'm doing great. Great to be back here, there, Ben. Yeah, our pleasure to have you. So, let's um, let's go ahead and give people a quick rundown of who you are and what you do, and you know, kind of what gives you the credentials to speak about cybersecurity. Absolutely, I'm running a 46-year-old wireless design and development company. We focus on a lot of unique niche products. We sell to three-letter agencies and they're typically wireless threat detection tools used by the cyber intelligence groups to hunt down various Wi-Fi threats, Bluetooth threats, cellular threats, other wireless threats. And we, we crisscross the span of cybersecurity all the time. So I'm fascinated by cybersecurity. I'm a big proponent, like yourself, educating people on, uh, on uh, uh, shows like this. And uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to, to be back and talk about some of these interesting topics uh, that, that keep uh, surfacing here in the news and uh, what we can do to hopefully stay safe on, in, in most of these cases. Yeah, no, and, and you know, I, I did find it rather interesting, you just mentioned there, that you do actually service uh, law enforcement agencies of all kinds, and, uh, you know, you provide the tools, but I, you know, I kind of think that, you know, because you come on the show and you are more than willing to talk about any, you know, really anything that is newsworthy, anything that you feel that people should, you know, know about. Like we have a story today that we're going to discuss uh, about the, uh, you know, about the NSA, which is a three-letter organization that, you know, potentially would contract someone such as yourself to make equipment for them and things like that. And but I think it's like that instance of I, I'm not saying that you make nuclear bomb parts, but you know back in the 40s when they were developing the nuke, they were uh, you know 
they had people working on every little part and they weren't assembling it all in one place because you know they didn't want anyone to know what they were doing and everyone had all these crazy ideas so i think it's kind of the same way for you because you know you're not strictly the person that makes all of the spy equipment for everyone for spying on everything you make equipment and you know we've seen the wireless technology and we've talked about it here on the program but my point is, is like you, you know, these are your customers, but you're willing to talk about them because, you know, you don't strictly make every little part or you're not, I guess, I don't want to say in cahoots, but, you know, why, why, why do you feel comfortable talking about these organizations on our show when, you know, these are your customers? Well, I do think that the sharing of information is important. And also maybe I look out stand, standing back as a consumer, as a small business owner, uh, privacy is a huge issue, and I think a lot of people are very upset when they start to realize that there is a level of invasion of privacy. So I think to just to, to keep it out there and keep the conversation going is a good thing. And I'm not necessarily for or against certain things. I'm just trying to hopefully share from my perspective what's really happening out there how safe is our personal information, what we can do to protect it. Uh, am I actively selling full disclosure to all those three-letter agencies? Absolutely. And, and even another level, uh, a lot of the uh, technical surveillance countermeasure uh, companies come to us often. I have come to us from the other side of the world to develop some unique tools that are really used for uh, sniffing bugs. The latest threat from uh, China are multi-band cellular bugs that can be used for both uh, audio and video eavesdropping. They're sold for about $35 each, which is alarmingly cheap. Imagine somebody goes through your facility and circuitously plants some of these low-cost bugs, and they could basically listen into any of your conversation or turn the camera on, and they don't just last for a day. Some of these have larger battery capacities, and can be turned on remotely, and they last for weeks. This is true spy stuff of, of James Bond and things that we joke about or see in movies. This is reality. So our tools are constantly being honed so the good guys can use them to quickly hunt down these bugs that are placed everywhere. And these are what I call true threats, unlike the days of, of these other bugs that could be easily seen with your eye. The newer bugs can be covertly integrated into things that are everyday items in our offices, in our companies, in our homes. That, to me, is scary. And, and, and people and business owners and government agencies and everybody at least needs to be aware there are ways to hunt these things down and keep yourself safe and keep your personal information personal and private. And... <laughs> You know, it's it's actually kind of uh, it's actually kind of funny. Like, you know, we cover uh, all these different pieces of technology on the show all the time, and still, even you know, someone who keeps as as close of an eye as I do, sometimes I'll see things and I'm like, wait, that's possible. And I can clearly remember the last one. Like, there was one technology where they were able to point a camera at a pane of window. And they were able to measure the very, very small vibrations of the sound waves and able to reconstruct a conversation by filming the glass on the window. So things like that. Uh, the other one was a camera that fit into, you know, like a Phillips, a Phillips head screw. The camera was able to fit into the crosshair of the screw itself. And, you know, you see these things and you're like, wow, they are getting really good at making this really small, tiny, inconspicuous, uh, sensitive technology. And you're right. I, I, I think as much knowledge as we can kind of spread about this, the better off everyone is going to be. So uh, yeah. again, yeah. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm happy that you're here to talk about it with us. And everyone, again, uh, we're going to have a link to Scott's website, uh, website, scottshoper.com. If you want to check out anything that, uh, you know, that we've talked about here so far, but we actually have a number of stories that you have brought to our attention. And as I told you before the program, we have mentioned one on the show. But I, you know, honestly, the uh, the Intercept, who I see you also found the, the article from, they did such an extensive, I guess, kind of job in covering this that I definitely did not cover, you know, even half of what this story actually entails. 
So I would like you to kind of lead us off with uh, the story about the, uh, you know, the NSA and what the spy hubs are that they've kind of tracked down and what they kind of mean for, you know, the Internet at large. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, and, and I found this story kind of intriguing and in part kind of what you were referring to. This, this is not necessarily a new story per se, um, because this, this NSA surveillance program has really been going on for many years. But only a few years ago, it was brought to light. I think much of it as a fallout from Edward Snowden uh, revelations, and then the media tended to dig in deeper and deeper, and more and more facts came out, more people came out and opened up. And I think this is kind of like another layer to that onion that's now been unraveled. There's been widespread reports that there are these spy hubs throughout the U.S. and abroad, admittedly, but nobody exactly knew how they tapped into the pipe of the data, um, where where they were able to actually pull it out, what information was fully available. I I remember even a a couple years ago, I think it was uh, 2015, I I talked on this specific subject when a lot of it was uh, coming to the fold, talking um, on Blaze TV. And it was interesting how little information there was. Now I go back in time and contrast and say, wow, we know so much more. And this article exposes a ton of things. And I think some of the key takeaways that really stood out in my mind are, is the AT&T network. AT&T is, is one of the dominant players. It's, it's by many standards, it's number one slash number uh, two, maybe at Verizon from the wireless side. Uh, but AT&T is really a hub of uh, Internet networked activity, and that's really what the key is. Uh, there were some stats in the article that were astounding. They said there's 197 petabytes of data which is about 49 trillion pages of text or 60 billion average size MP3 files that travel across the AT&T network every single business day. How many zeros that is or how much, we can't even fathom it. It's ridiculous. But that shows how much data is being used. And you got a nice graph up there showing the eight different cities that they've clearly identified where these spy hubs are. And basically what it is is, a lot of cases where AT&T has rerouted the data to go through these hubs, which are, in a sense, giant collection engines that have a lot of smart algorithms that can pull out key pieces of data, almost like a search engine, if you were. So if they wanted to target individuals that were suspicious or spies or things of that nature, they could easily do that. And, And really, that's the the reason behind it, why they actually do it, what the claim is behind it. Do they have the ability to spy on uh, on Ben Crossman and Scott Schober and everyone else? Yeah, they kind of do. <laughs> Part of the challenge is, uh, now, I, I have an AT&T account, so that makes it a little easier Me for too. them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but think beyond that. What is AT&T connected with? Well, They've got a well, pipe, pipe uh, under the sea. Uh, They're connected with all these other carriers, so it opens up Pandora's box. Yeah, and... Yeah. I guess a couple of things to kind of mention there are, first of all, AT&T, you know, this story is intrinsically tied to that particular company. So I'm sure that there is more digging to be done on Verizon and, you know, uh, Charter and, you know, all these other services, but they really focus in on, I guess, AT&T's role in sharing that flow of data uh, to, you know, to the NSA. So that's why we're kind of picking our, you know, focusing on AT&T is because they're the ones who are kind of sharing this real estate, sharing the, the, the network traffic. And an, another thing that I'm sure that's mentioned if you, you know, kind of dig into the article a little bit more, uh, if you're sitting out there and you're thinking, don't worry, I have Verizon or I have Charter, I'm good to go. Don't worry about that. Um, no, because, you know, I, I believe, again, as the article mentions, Network traffic is this kind of uh, very fluid idea where they'll build out the infrastructure and depending on on demand and supply of available bandwidth versus the bandwidth you know needed to transfer all the data, you know for you to get your email, for you to go to Netflix, for you to buy something on Amazon, blah blah blah. 
uh, they will constantly buy and sell in very quick transactions. Uh, you know, I have 10,000 people that are looking to get to this server in this part of the state. Let's use AT&T's network because that's going to be faster than over congesting maybe Comcast network and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, tons of little municipalities throughout uh, in between. Networking is very complicated on a national scale. But my point is, is that all of the data, you know, even if you're not an AT&T customer, even if you've never even made an account with them, your data undoubtedly still flows through AT&T servers. And so it's still being collected in this kind of operation, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well said. And it was nice the article pointed out, you wonder how big this footprint is. It mentions that they have 19,500, this AT&T points of presence in 149 different countries where all of this internet traffic is exchanged but the the backbone in these eight facilities and, and they happen to be you know just general buildings that don't really have a sign out front per se that are kind of co-located with AT&T key common backbone facilities in these key cities in the United States that gives them direct access to all of this it, it, it's pretty scary how much that's, access that the government has. <laughs> yeah, that's that. I think was one of the uh, you know one of the things that kind of led uh, these reporters to this was that there were no signs. There was not a sign on the door saying, "Hey, this is NSA property. Uh, do not enter." And you know there are thousands of people, uh, thousands of people working at these facilities, and you know they kind of kept them on the hush hush. They look like any other office building that you say, "Oh, well, they're doing business stuff." And turns out that business stuff happens to be uh, collecting and sifting through uh, communications all over the country. And, you know, as you said, from 149 different countries, it's, uh, you know, I guess it's just kind of shocking because I think, you know, somewhere later in the article, they actually just have, you know, kind of pictures of them. And, you know, some say just AT&T on the door. Some don't say anything. And... Yeah, they're they're uh, you know I said the backbone of what makes up the um, you know the surveillance in this country, and it's so I I guess the question is why did they have or uh, uh, yeah why did they have to kind of spread these out? Why do they keep them surreptitious? I mean, is this something that people should know about, or is this just how they operate and? Uh, this article is an affront to what they kind of do, or is this like, yeah, so so what if they know, you know, the NSA is still going to do what the NSA does? Well, well, I think I should point out, this is not something, again, new. This has been going on. The part that's kind of the what, the surprise moment, is that we didn't know to the extent this was being done or where it was being done. In fact, they, in the article kind of made me chuckle. One of the particular locations in New York City is a... Uh, uh, right down the street from Hell's Kitchen, and, and one of the buildings identified, I think they have a picture of it there, it has no windows, it's a nuclear blast-resistant facility that houses all of this equipment, pretty scary stuff, but you would walk by it each and every day, you would never even know it. AT&T has, in a sense, gone out of their way, and they're working closely with NSA, and the article, I think, quoted, it said, AT&T's extreme willingness to help the NSA is one of the reasons that it's been such a successful relationship and the ability for them to tap into this, this data and uh, use it for hopefully hunting down bad guys and, and, and stopping terrorist actions and other negative things to happen. So we don't necessarily want to focus just on the privacy side and say they're spying on us what? As, okay. as individuals, but really more protecting us from bad guys. So, and I, I, I think the NSA, um, you know, ever since Edward Snowden kind of brought it, uh, brought it up to attention, and you could uh, extrapolate that to, oh, Project Prism and a ton of other government uh, types of things, which, you know, I start to say these things, and, you know, being talk radio, we share the airwaves with a lot of, uh, I don't want to say conspiracy theorists, but um, <laughs> let's just say a lot of our friends run shows that talk about uh, alien abductions quite often, but, um, so, you know, being talk radio, we, we, you know, we hear a lot of, uh, of conspiracy theories and as, you know, as I say like project prism and, you know, Edward Snowden, blah, blah, blah. And you start to feel like you're talking about conspiracy theory, but 
you know, if this stuff wasn't so well documented and, uh, and, and you know, exposed and things like that, this would have been a conspiracy seven, eight years ago. But now it's just, okay, so that's kind of what they're doing. That, that's kind of good to know. Um, my question is, because they said the extreme willingness of AT&T, what, um, what do you think AT&T gets out of this? Do you think AT&T was compelled by court orders? Do you think this was pressure applied, uh, you know, through legislation, uh, you know, saying, hey, if you don't let us into your networks, we won't give you contracts for things like, do you think there's any kind of, uh, you know, what is the incentive for AT&T to do this? Because, you know, uh, we've talked about Apple and how they have taken some pretty hardline stances against giving the government access to its users' data. But AT&T does not have that qualm. Is this, do you think there's anything that says AT&T has to do this or, AT or why AT&T wants to do this? Uh. Well, well, let me start by saying here, here's AT&T's official statement. Uh, their spokesperson said they're required by law to provide information to government and law enforcement entities by complying with court orders, subpoenas, lawful discovery requests, and other legal requirements. They added voluntary assistance to law enforcement when a person's life is in danger. Do I believe they do all of that for those reasons? Yes, I do. Is there more reasons in addition to that? Sure, there probably is. There's some positive business things that if they're working with the government and certain agencies that will help them, in it, be it building out networks, being the, uh, if they have to require to uh, do certain things to the law, it may help them if they're leveraging working with the FCC for wireless spectrum and they need to build out things. And remember, the government is one of the biggest users of spectrum and equipment and communications, mm -hmm. so it's in their best interest to work closely with them and help one another and, and be a good partner. So this is part of their way, I think, of doing that. Are they doing something illegal or wrong? I don't want to step over the line and say that because I don't know for a fact, but there sure are a lot of revelations here that make one wonder. It, 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 yeah, and really, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not readily apparent if anything's illegal or you know anything strictly uh you know because a, a lot of this it came about after of course 9 11 and the idea that we need to have a more uh not just a quicker response but a more all-encompassing way to monitor communications so that something like uh you know 9 11 or any other terrorist threat national security threat were to happen again and, uh, you know, of, of course, ever since, uh, as I said, Edward Snowden, uh, the, the extent to which we allow that to happen behind the scenes, that's the part where the conversation needs to start happening about how much the government is surveilling and, you know, how much they're collecting. You mentioned that someone in the chat room was kind enough to type out, uh, you know, just how much data in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, kilobytes. And I think it's like, uh, was that, uh, well, uh, you know, whatever it was, pet petabytes, it was like 197 with 15 zeros. Like, they're wow. collecting so much data at the same time. And, I, and, you know, just real quick, just to tie in some other technology into this, Scott, that I'm sure that you have started using on the pro, you know, in your own company uh, to some extent. This really wasn't a problem. Uh, in 2011, in 2009, in 2012, because you could collect all that kind of data and they built server farms in the middle of nowhere that could house that much data. But the question became, how do you use that much data? Because you can't sift through it looking for one text message. There's no control F function to go through all these, uh, you know, all these communications. And I guess the rise of machine learning, the ability to give the task to a computer and say, hey, here's, you know, here's today's data for the entire country. Look for anything that mentions these keywords or has this going on. Do you think the rise of machine learning and, you know, the fact that this much data is now usable data instead of just bulk data, do you think that makes a difference going forward? 
Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on. You, the combination of machine learning, artificial intelligence, maybe even to some extent deep learning what's coming ahead um, is, is extremely important in processing this data as well as just sheer uh, computing power. Uh, we, we've talked in the past of something, uh, even the mining of bitcoins and other cryptocurrency. That, that's not just helping the world of crypto. What that's really doing is advancing technology from a processing standpoint, which is used in electric vehicles and smart homes and so many other things. The same here, I'm sure the NSA, they appreciate the processing power and capability that they're going to be able to get to, to crunch that much data so they can make it meaningful and make it responsive. There's probably hundreds, if not more, maybe thousands of terrorist attacks that could have made the headlines but have been thwarted, we know nothing about mm -hmm. because of what actually happens behind the scenes with these spy hubs. So, yes, there's a lot of privacy issues here, but again, it's what it's preventing that we don't even know about that, that makes you feel better at least. The warm and fuzzy side is uncomfortable because that means they have access to everything about us and everything we type and and say and sing and so on and so forth of the pictures we send and post, but but they are keeping us safer. So I and you know we have gone over things that people can do to uh, not not that we're trying to tell people how to commit the perfect crime, but you know we give them tips on how to keep themselves from being monitored, tracked, whatever. Things such as VP, uh, VPN, things such as avoiding, uh, you know, Google and things like this. But then, when you see just how, uh, just how ingrained monitoring is on the internet, just how because you know these sites are wholly dedicated to taking all traffic and rerouting it, and or at least you know making a copy of it, and you know letting it kind of do its thing, but at the same time, still sniffing it out. Is there any VPN that kind of beats this? Is there any uh, service that promises not to put cookies on your computer that makes people feel safer about using the internet? Or at this point, do we just ha kind of have to say, if you are, if, if you're doing something bad, there's a way for them to find it. If there's a way that you want to stay private, don't go on the internet because the internet is not private. Period. Yes, probably your latter point. I concur. Nothing, nothing is 100%, I always say. And part of the reason is 99% of the people that are using the Internet and communications in general don't bother with any levels of security. If you use basic encryption, if, you, if you're doing a, a search on DuckDuckGo, which is in, encrypted and will bounce your IP traffic, if you're using a good VPN, and there's even some free VPNs, or VPN for Life, or Pure VPN, a lot of different ones out there that are extremely cost effective that will keep your data encrypted, that will bounce your IP traffic, that will keep you, I call it anonymous, on the Internet so you can't be tracked and have a level of privacy. You can use it. There, there, there's different applications that we use that have end-to-end -end encryption, such as texting. It's more popular than voice communication now. We can use different things that have true end-to-end encryption on it that can't be hacked. Uh, Squeal Lock is a great program that I've fooled around with, played with, and used to communicate when I want to have a secure conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's encrypted, and it erases the message after you hit send. You can't get a screenshot. Uh, somebody can't take a screenshot of it, or it'll alert you. There's other things that are very valuable features. Is that for somebody paranoid? Perhaps. But it allows the, the consumer or the user to make their own decision how secure they want to keep the conversation and what they want to put out there and how well they want to protect it. But, but it seems like story again and again and again, our wireless, our texting, our email, PGP encryption, everything. The, the list goes on and on. Everything's getting compromised that we thought was secure. So we need to ratchet it up and start using things like, like we're talking about here to protect our basic communications. Right, and one of my favorite pictures from this article <laughs> includes this one, where it's simply a, a, a room. You think it was a store, a storage closet in AT and T, and they said that this room, supposedly within AT and T, houses NSA surveillance equipment. Which, you know, I, I don't know how big that room is, but it's just kind of a closet off to the side that is, you know, that happens to be that 
space for NSA to put their equipment, lock the door, and walk away from it as everything is passively, you know, kind of sucked up. And I, I, the only, and you know, I think we're going to wrap up this conversation there because this, these are rather big, uh, you know. Not even big because I think you know you you knew I knew and I think the general public assumed to a certain extent that they were being monitored on the internet. It's uh, you know it, it's just one of those things. But I do take kind of comfort in the fact that, and they called it a semantic traffic analyzer. Um, that you know when I was growing up, I'd go over to my friend's computer, go onto their Facebook account, and type in you know uh, bomb terrorist things like you know bad words. And it'd be like, congratulations, you're on a list now. And that may have been true. I may have gotten them onto a list. So interesting. But everyone, music means we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Scott Schober and more cybersecurity news right after this. Everyone, stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is, oh, 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And by the way, the folks in the chat room have been very uh, diligent because while we have been talking about the story about uh, you know the NSA and the spy hubs, they've been linking a couple other stories that uh, you know actually if you're listening uh, to today's show live, there's a Google Home outage, and so uh, Google Homes and Chromecast are all down nationwide, and yeah, so if you're having problems with that, then that is uh, you know hey then that's the issue. Google said that they are still quote unquote heads down working on the issue. Uh, also, you know, apparently the, uh, let's see, the other article that they brought to our attention was the National Cybersecurity Center, uh, and of course, Center spelt with a C-E-N-T-R-E, because they are the uh, UK government, uh, said that there is an issue with, uh, with Ticketmaster, and they said that they have, uh, you know, there's a cybersecurity incident, quote-unquote, with Ticketmaster, so more information to come out about that, but, um, yeah, uh, folks, again, I just, I just really want to drill to you people. Uh, the chat room, it's a great way to kind of submit stories, talk about things, and uh, hey, talk with your fellow listeners. And in the meantime, we continue on with Mr. Scott Schober, who, uh, you know, honestly, when we first did this article, um, you know, I saw the length of it, and I was like, I'm not going to be able to understand any of this. And uh, Scott Schober has been a great uh, help in understanding what, uh, you know, what these spy hubs actually mean and how at and and everyone ties in with it. But, uh, but yeah, Scott, thank you for continuing on with us. 
Yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and switch up topics and go from, you know, let's keep the theme of the NSA going and then we'll be done with it for the day. But just real quick, let's talk about the reality winner, the ex-NSA contractor accused of leaking secrets pleads guilty. So the NSA has a lot of, and I, I guess it's the nature of the work, you know, just kind of what you end up doing that led to Edward Snowden, who has been uh, exiled from the United States for a number of years, because as soon as he steps foot or anywhere that the U.S. can get their hands on him, they're going to haul him off to prison for doing exactly what this woman just, you know, pled guilty to. Um, although, you know, she's not getting the same, I don't want to say celebrity treatment, but the same, uh, uh, the same level of, wow, what a, you know, kind of what a hero for openness about the government. But yeah, talk about this. And this is kind of the flip side of what could have happened to Edward Snowden about leaking the NSA's secrets for, you know, kind of what they're doing. And why, why is this one different than, you know, what we've had in the past? Well, well I guess the, the interesting part of this, she, she's fairly young. She's 26 years old, I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, she came across this, this information. She basically had a number of pieces of confidential top secret papers, folded them up and tucked them away in her pantyhose and got out and snuck out this information, likely sold it, and it, a lot of these revelations were things all again tied back to that wonderful thing about U.S. presidential election hacking and, and Russian interference. The story has got more twists and turns, and I find it extremely confusing because there's so much misreporting on this. And there's also so many people that are being paid to falsely report. I myself has been, have been contacted by two Russian media outlets to falsely report some information, which I... Uh, immediately denied and would not share the information because it was clearly wrong. A lot of this is going around there, so how much do you believe and don't believe is what's so difficult, I think. But really under the Trump presidency, which hasn't been that long, I think this is really the, the first major time they cracked down, they, they, they took action and said, hey, here's leaked classified information. We're going to prosecute somebody. You're going to jail. Enough is enough. This is espionage. And she, I guess, uh, pleaded guilty to a lesser sentence there, reduced uh, prison time. But what it does is I think it kind of sets a line in the sand. She said she believed the public should have access to these different documents and what's going on, so on and so forth. So, you know, listeners have to decide for themselves, is she guilty or is she not guilty? Um, should this information be public or not? But I think that the U.S. government is really putting that line in the sand and saying enough is enough. Any espionage where classified information is going to be leaked, we're going to prosecute. And, and that's going to send probably a little bit of a shock through the whole community and have people uh, not be so quick to publicly release this and sell it to The Intercept or other uh, media outlets and news agencies. They're going to think twice, and they're going to have to be very, very careful before they take those steps because they may end up in the slammer. Yeah, and you know, we did just cover that entire article from, you know, from The Intercept about those eight hubs. And, you know, it's it's kind of the same thing. I'm sure that they've talked with people who, you know, sources vary about, you know, just how useful they can be. I'm sure a lot of people they talked to were like, oh, that's an NSA facility. I worked in that same building and had no idea, um, you know, and that can extend out to everyone who kind of tipped them off. And I, I, I guess that my point we had a great conversation about the capabilities of what our government is able to do when it comes to monitoring communications in this country. Uh, and at the same time, seeing them put someone in prison for, you know, trying to highlight that in their own way, admittedly, you know, not, you know, probably not through proper channels, because if it was through proper channels, we might have not have ever heard of it. But um, yeah, I, I, I guess the idea of being a whistleblower uh, used to be, you know, used to be a good thing. It used to be a patriotic act. If you saw something that you felt was not justified, then you take it to the public. But that can now earn you, you know, six years in prison, five years in prison. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess the shock is, you know, be careful when you sign those agreements or you work with these agencies that national security is definitely at stake. It's just, you know, in, in this case, I guess, 
I guess they really didn't find her justified, I, you know, is the point. So, yeah. yeah. You could get an orange jumpsuit. That's what they're basically telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful with that. So, or, hey, uh, you know, live in, uh, live in Russia for the rest of your life. So, with, uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and move over to some of these other stories. And I actually... I really like this one because this is something that we've talked to a number of organizations uh, such as Intel and, you know, large, large companies about the need for education when it comes to not just STEM, but technology in particular and how a lot of these initiatives, uh, you know, some of them are aimed at women and getting, uh, you know, have like women competition for robotics building and, uh, you know, software programming, things like that. Uh, others are looking on how to get you know middle schoolers or high schoolers uh, more interested in technology, but um, you know you you found an article here that is a little bit different because you know learning how to program in Python is a little bit different than explicitly telling your kids how to develop hacking skills. So you found this article. I thought it was interesting. Uh, a different take on getting kids interested in technology. Why Why did this one catch your eye? Yeah, you make a great point there. This one, I think, did catch my eye because what do we often think about whenever we think about hacking? It, it's kind of the, the guy in the hoodie in the basement, that, that kind of mentality. And what I think this article helped me appreciate is at a young age, you can get teenagers involved in technology, involved in computers and learning and they could do good with that they they can they can analyze problems they could learn how to navigate through computer networks uh, they maybe they want to become somebody that that battles good versus evil and learn cybersecurity and fight the bad guys and these organized crime rings on the dark web or maybe they want to get a job with the the government and join a task force to battle the hackers or something like that. What it does is it exposes them at a very young age, and I think that's very important. Uh, myself, I, I always reflect back to my childhood. I tinkered with computers at a young age. I was the president of the computer club in seventh grade. I loved it because it allowed me after school to dive into a computer, learn, but then also teach others. And yes, I too were became you, a hacker. <laughs> were, were, were you one of those people that uh, scammed the uh, the telephone companies to get free long distance phone calls and you know played the tones over the phone and yeah it, you know because I heard that a lot of hackers started with essentially the phone system you know before there were computers in people's homes they learned how to hack the you know the the phone industry. Yeah, that that was a little before my time. Okay. I was in the mid eighties on as a hacker hacking Apple and Atari game systems, basically pirating games, copying them, <laughs> and, and then surfing on different, before the world of the Internet, it was basically a bulletin board yeah. where you could yeah. get on with a system operator, 110 acoustic modem with my phone I would plug in, and I would access different sites around the world and often work your way up in levels of trust and passwords where you could then hack in and, and pirate games, and so on and so forth. The generation right before me it was the phone freaking, and that was really uh, the Kevin Mitnick's of the world, Steve Jobs, uh, Wozniak, a couple others. They were phone freaks where they would actually, um, the phone freaking was, was basically compromising the phone system and manipulating it so you could make long-distance calls and have fun. I, I find that area fascinating, and those are certainly colleagues that, that, that I look up to and have learned a ton from, and I've had the privilege of uh, interviewing Kevin Mitnick a few times and, and speaking at the same cybersecurity conferences and such and read his books. And uh, so I've learned a lot from that generation. Uh, and I grew up maybe a little bit younger as they were kind of in their heyday of hacking. I was more on the computer side of hacking gotcha. rather than the phone side. That's So, all. yeah, so... I guess the question becomes because a lot of that is, uh, you know, and a lot of these stories that we hear are people who take extracurricular, uh, extracurricular activities or, you know, maybe it's their hobby in their spare time. Maybe a parent gets them into it. Um, and, you know, let's face it, the prevalence of computers back in the 70s, 80s, and, you know, and to a small extent, the 90s, um, was much harder to come by than it is today. Today, 
a lot of kids they're born with a tablet in their hands because and and they take like it uh, you know and they take to it like a duck to water so i mean everyone has exposure to technology but i guess the the question in part here isn't about you know getting kids to use tech but it's about getting them a bit deeper than uh you know than using twitter or facebook whatever or it's about getting them to actually dig in and hack something, uh, change something, find out how it works. You know, there's a difference between driving a, a car and becoming a mechanic. Um, do you think that that's something that should happen in schools or should we rely on, you know, parents and kids to just kind of do this organically like they have in the past? Um, and what does that say kind of about, about the future economy of uh, the need for cybersecurity professionals or even just tech minded professionals? I think your your analogy hits the nail on the head with, with the car and, and a mechanic. Where basically you could say when you get under the hood and know what makes it tick, and, and even the next level of that, if you've ever had a car and I had a Mazda RX-7 for example, and you tinker with it and you start taking apart the car and find ways to get another five horsepower here, and so it handles the road a little bit better and tighter suspension, so on and so forth. That's hacking a car in a sense, mm -hmm. and you're improving, you're building upon knowledge, something that's been mass-produced. Same thing here with hacking computers. You're taking apart computers, you're taking apart software, algorithms, know-how, and you're building upon that, making it better, and you're learning in the process. So to, to answer your question, should it be done in school? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of it. That, that, that's the, the basics of the outside. But if it becomes a hobby, and I always encourage people Make your job your hobby, then you're going to enjoy it and love it, and you're going to excel at it. Oh, yeah, and by the way, hopefully you'll make money to pay the bills, but you'll have fun doing it. I love my job because I'm having fun talking about cybersecurity and designing tools to keep people safe and educating them. Find what you love and then educate yourself so it becomes your hobby. When, when you're sitting on the beach looking for something to do, you're going through a magazine and reading about your hobby, which is your livelihood also, that's, that's I think, the perfect match for doing well. And, and there is a shortage of cyber uh, skills. 1.8 million positions are needed to be filled by 2022. That's around the corner. There's not enough bodies. There's not enough talent to fill those positions. What does that mean? You're going to make a lot more money at it. There's a lot more demand. You can choose the position you want. But where are you going to learn that? You want to learn that now when you're younger not just because you have techie ability to work a mobile phone or a tablet or a computer, but because, again, you lift the hood up, you dig underneath, and you understand what makes it tick. When I was a kid, I was pulling ROMs out, install, upgrading memory, upgrading computer systems and configuring it, trying to hack and fool around and understand what makes this computer tick. How do I change this algorithm? How do I modify this game? Those type of things are the skills of hacking not necessarily the connotation of the negative hacker today. The connotation is stealing somebody's password, money, account information for for personal gain, doing dishonest things. So the the name is kind of goes back and forth. We're talking hacking from a good side. That's right. All. Right. Hacking from a good side and just getting getting people interested in using or understanding technology a bit more than just, hey, I can check my email. I am a technology genius. Um <laughs> So and and I and I guess so as you're saying that all leads to uh, filling that workforce that currently is going unfilled and I, I, like I said there's a lot of interest in, there's a lot of interest in not just getting uh, the current generation of computer scientists or you know uh, security professionals out there but also getting less represented segments of the population because. You know, no offense, but I could use you as an example. A lot of people that come on the program are white males. And I'm not saying that as white males are dominant, therefore they're bad. I'm saying that that's because that's about what the workforce is. The workforce is white male. And it's, a, you know, just seeing the people that come, the guests that come on our show, we have them from all different fields of technology. And I would say just using our show as an example, I'd say it's about 70-30 male to female, and I don't really do the research to, you know, check out their ethnicity, but, you know, just going by accents, 
white males are definitely everywhere and i guess just getting that interest of you know if you if you're a woman if you happen to be black if you happen to be any other ethnicity you have a welcome space here and it's not that we don't want you here it's that we need you here not because of your skin tone not because of your gender but because we need everyone we need anyone and everyone from different viewpoints to come into this field so I, yeah, well, I, well, well said. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's a, a worthwhile effort, and getting, and definitely getting them, uh, not just using technology, because as I said, everyone's using technology, but to understand technology, that's going to be important, not just for tech, but just for an educated population. I, 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 I honestly feel like, um, you know, having all these people use computers, and then having, you know, the abilities of, hey, we just talked about the NSA. And then, you know, having that disparity between one side knows everything and the other side barely knows anything, that can also cause a lot of friction in society. So, yeah, all right. Yeah, there, yeah. there was a great article just to throw out there sure. on that topic, um, cybersecurityventures.com. And, and what they did was they actually put together a nice comprehensive list of 58 women in cybersecurity to follow on Twitter and so on and so forth, and they're growing that list. What I liked about it is it, 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 these are basically women that are the rock stars of cybersecurity that have been identified, and there's a whole lot more that they're going to be adding to it. So if people do want to network and get to know them and learn from them, it, it's a great way to do it when you find lists like that. Absolutely, absolutely. So, all right, so let's go ahead and strike that one from our list. So, uh, hey, if you're a teen out there, go hack something. Don't get arrested. Good luck. Um, okay. So for everyone else, let's... Um, yeah, let's talk about this one. I, I, I like the idea because uh, obviously you come on the program, you sell a number of products that, uh, you know, detect maybe, uh, you know, Bluetooth devices that are looking to steal information or at t skimmers, things like that, wireless technology. And I guess this would be right up your alley because someone has decked out a van to look like literally a James Bond movie van. Like this thing is... Uh, crazy on the inside, a $5 million surveillance car that hacks iPhones from about 500 meters, which works out to be like 1,800 feet away. So, yeah, what what about this? This thing is over the top, and it's just cool. To me, what they should have done, though, is made this like a mobile dog grooming vehicle with puppies on the outside or something <laughs> to be truly covert. They've got 24 antennas on this thing. So it's probably some type of linear array or switching uh, antennas where they can get directionality. And I thought the part that's interesting here is what they're not doing is they're not taking our, our, our Apple phones or Google phones and trying to directly hack and target them based upon the carrier's 4G LTE signals. Why? It's because that's so stinking hard to do. It's a modulated signal, understanding the frequencies, the handoffs to the tower, so on and so forth. What do they do? They cleverly do is they force the phone to go to its Wi-Fi. Why? Because Wi-Fi is it's, uh, public. It's accepted. It's an IEEE standard. It's free. There's no licenses. The bands are known. The channels are known. And they can manipulate it, and there's a lot of freeware out there that they could couple with some powerful hardware where they could direction find on you. We, we've even done some tools that effectively will associate to a Wi-Fi device, and what you can do is basically ping to it and force it to ping back its whereabouts and location. And that's great if you're trying to compromise the phone or perform what's called a man-in-the-middle attack. I've demonstrated this at a couple hacking conventions. We did it a little bit differently. We used a drone uh, and brought it indoors, and we connected up a bridge access point to it, and what we did was we, we would spoof, in a sense, the, the local hotel that held the event, and if it was the Hilton, we'd say, you know, Hilton free Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and we'd have all of the audience associated to it, and then their data would go through our bridge AP, and we could perform a man-in-the-middle attack. This is similar to that, but this is mobile with a lot more horsepower, a lot more money spent on the actual antennas, and the distance that they could, could go. It's not just in a room. This is 500 meters is pretty impressive if they can accomplish that, um, and, and hence the close to $5 million price tag for this, this mobile sniffing vehicle. Pretty impressive.
yeah, the, the vehicle is obviously being shown at a trade show. So they're not, you know, so obviously they're trying to show off what they can do uh, to your point that they didn't put puppies on the outside or, you know, put an ice cream, you know, AC vent up top, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. But, you know, against your point, the 500 meters, if you park that in the middle of or if you even drove it around in circles uh, in the middle of New York City, you would you would be darn close getting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of devices that would potentially connect to your Wi-Fi, especially if it was, un you know, uh, no password, they would connect to it instantly because, hey, free, free data. That is such exactly. an attractive thing to so many people. You know, I, I was recently out, you know, do, running errands and I had to, I had a lot of downtime. So I was sitting there on my phone and my, like my phone would tell me constantly, uh, so and so Wi-Fi network is available to use. Would you like to turn it on? And it would always be the guest for the you know for the facility I'm at, or uh, you know it'd be guest Wi-Fi. I would never connect to it because I'll I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, Scott. You have scared the bejeebus out of me, so I am afraid <laughs> to connect to anything public. But um, yeah, like your phone prompts you and tells you there's a new Wi-Fi signal that you can connect to. Would you like to connect to it? Like it asks you to essentially fall victim to something like this. So this is pretty cool. Again, uh, not supremely practical because uh, again, you have this van and yes, you could kind of hide it, but at the same time, it's still gonna have plenty of antennas nestled inside of it. But it was cool. Uh, it, it's, if nothing else, it shows the possibilities that are out there. And that's, uh, you know, exactly. it, and, that, and that's really cool. So, okay. Cool factor, they got a 10 on that one, I think. but. Public outcry, if you saw this, this van coming, what I would do is you'd be very tempted to reach down and pull out a couple uh, jammers, and next thing you know, you protect your uh, connection, <laughs> which <laughs> <You're>, is illegal. <laughs> e either that or just turn off everything. Like, you see this van exactly. stroll by, you just turn everything off. So, <laughs> with that being said, we have one more article I think we can get to, and this is, and honestly, we talked about this a little while ago back in April, they found a way to jailbreak the switch hardware on the device. So essentially, if anyone ever made a, a clone of the Nintendo operating system and they were able to release their own software for the Nintendo Switch, which is their latest gaming console, they would be able to essentially install their own software onto the Switch and have their own games and essentially run their own system. And that is... That is a treasure trove to people who look to jailbreak or hack or, you know, do any kind of thing that in a closed ecosystem, Nintendo or Apple or anyone else wouldn't want you to do, obviously, by default. So you have this article here, Kotaku, and they're talking about the fight between hackers and Nintendo is ramping up. I'm assuming it's the fallout from what we were talking about earlier. Um... But yeah, what in just a couple in just like a minute or two, what's been going on here? Yeah, just a, a brief thought which stood out in my mind. First of all, uh, pirated software. We don't realize how much damage it causes. Uh, each year, it's about eighteen billion dollars a year globally. Pirated software. Was I guilty of it in the past? Yes, uh, and I'm reformed uh, and not a mm -hmm. hacker anymore. Uh, and and they mentioned that there's uh, one of the research articles I saw. Over 10 million Switch consoles have been sold worldwide by Nintendo. So a huge amount out there, huge user base out there. And the part that's interesting, I guess, the spin on this, is they're basically providing means to hack and run pirated software. The software that they themselves sell, and I think it's $25 a copy, they put in there protection so nobody could pirate their software. So it's kind of an ironic situation where they're actually trying to discourage piracy by creating something that encourages piracy. I never saw anything like this and, and just found the whole the whole thing fascinating as I started to dig into it. Yeah, no, and, and as we you know, as we first covered it uh, a little while ago, we said that is something that's going to have repercussions for a long, long time because it was a matter of hardware. Like, it wasn't just a software update and they could patch it. It's a matter of hardware and they cannot fix it. So, 
yeah there you go so but hey the music means that we are just about done here and scott one more time uh people want to find out more about you where can they go certainly they could go to my website scottshoberg.com and my company's website is b is in boy v is in victor systems.com or you could find me out there in the world of of twitter certainly scott bvs I gotcha, I gotcha. Very, very cool. And everyone, once again, thank you for tuning into Computer America. Be sure to check us out here tomorrow, same time, same place, 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern. And Scott, we'll be sure to catch you next month. Uh, Great topics as always, and uh, glad to have your expertise on this. Great. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks again, Ben. All right. Have a great one. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. And there he goes. So yeah. And hey, that's our show. Thank you for tuning into Computer America. Hopefully you had fun. You learned something. And uh, yeah, we didn't scare you too bad. And hey, no harm in checking for monsters monsters on, under the bed anyways. So folks, be sure to tune in tomorrow as we talk to, let me get this straight from our calendar here. We will be talking to a company called OneSpan if all things go as planned. And yeah, it looks like it's all going to be about, um, you know, what they can do and uh, yeah, and just everything about OneSpan. So folks, until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, catch you next time. Bye-bye everyone.